Yes, he's from Goa, India, and uh, uh, actually he is known to us uh, uh, for almost uh, uh, 18 years, I think, 18 years. And uh, you know, uh, he's, a, he's a tremendous man of God and serving God in a in a in a in a, in a I mean, different capacities capacities in in, in Goa and uh, uh, in other states of India also. And uh, uh, this morning we are so glad that you are with us, Pastor. And uh, uh, you know, actually he is not a Malayali. Uh, he is a Goan, and uh, his wife is a Malayali. So that's a, that's an interesting thing. His wife, wife is a Malayali, and uh, uh, we are so glad that you are here. And Pastor Stephen is the pastor of New Creation Church, Panaji, Goa. So tremendously, uh, tremendously used by God uh, uh, in in different places. Now uh, it's a privilege to have Pastor Stephen, and uh, uh, let us all sit in the presence of God with a with a prayerful attitude, and uh, also. Uh, you know, we have uh, one sister, Jessica, uh, joining us with this the, the, in this uh, service. Uh, she is the uh, friend of uh, Pastor Stephen. Uh, she is joining with us from uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. And so we are I mean, welcoming you, sister, and uh, God bless you also. And uh, this morning, shall we all I mean, put our hands together and welcome Pastor Stephen Mendes uh, to speak the word of God this morning. Praise God. Praise the Lord. So thank you very much, Pastor Sam Kuti, uh, for this warm welcome uh, to your home and to your congregation. And uh, I know it's morning over there and we are just approaching midnight over here, entering into a, a new day. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, because of the gift of this technology, we can reach to you and you can reach to us without even traveling, but being in the comfort of your home. So I bring greetings to you. Uh, from the New Creations Church here in Panjim, Goa. And yes, as Pastor Sam, uh, your pastor has told, uh, informed, yes, we have known each other for almost 18 years. And uh, one thing what uh, describes him is uh, two words, a gentle shepherd, you know, uh, he's a really a gentle man, gentle in approach, uh, approaching people. And I want to really thank, uh, tell you, church, uh, that you have been blessed with a great man of God who really carries the shepherd heart, who carries the real burden for God's people. And I truly believe that, you know, this particular season that he is here in Sacramento among in your midst is going to be a real blessing and an upliftment in your spiritual lives. And today it's my great privilege uh, uh, to come into your homes and to share this word of God, what the Lord has laid upon my heart. So even before we can go into this word, uh, I just uh, request you that, you know, wherever you are, we'll just take a moment to pray and submit this word because it is not about the speaker who's going to speak, but it is about the eternal word of God that will work into our lives. So let us just uh, close our eyes and let us commit this word into God's hand and let us believe that God will speak to us this morning. Dear Father, we want to thank and praise you for this moment and for this opportunity. And Lord, even as we come together, as the global church, as the saints of God from different parts of the world in one accord to hear your word. Lord, we just declare that your word, which is sharper than any double-edged sword, your word, which is living and active. And Father, as your word says, that the word that comes out from your mouth shall not return back to you void, but accomplish your purpose. I pray that it will accomplish your purpose into each one of our lives, O Lord God. Lord, even as I stand and speak your word, Lord, I declare it is not in me, but Lord, use me as your servant. And Lord, I also stand corrected, O Lord God. Speak to me too as I minister thy word. Lord, let your name be glorified and we commit this church into your mighty hands. And we pray that whatever be the purpose of yours in Sacramento and beyond, let it be accomplished through this local church. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this morning, I would like to share, uh, I think so you'll be sharing the screen also uh, later on with the slide. Uh, this morning, I just want to share from the book of 1 Peter uh, and chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, you know, you can just open up and just follow it, you know. And uh, we will be basically looking from verse number 3 to verse number 7. And it's uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. And this uh, epistle has been written by Apostle Peter. And the theme which I have just titled for this particular teaching and sermon is resources to face sufferings of life. 
And the moment when we talk about sufferings, you know, uh, nobody is you know exempted from sufferings. You don't need big dictionary to explain what is suffering, because each one of us have gone through seasons of suffering in our lives. And as the dictionary says, suffering is a feeling or an experience of pain or distress. And this is what we experience when we suffer some loss, whether it is a financial loss, whether it is a loss of a loved one, or some sort of an injury, whether it is a physical injury, whether it's an emotional injury. And we all experience suffering in our lives. And if you look into human history, there are various examples of human suffering. Sufferings can be a result of conflicts. We can remember about the two world wars, which we have read in the history books, especially the Second World War, where countless billions of lives were uh, lost, the Holocaust, and how many millions had to suffer the consequences of those world wars. We talk about the financial suffering, you know, uh, people losing job. We have heard about the big depression. We were there in the United States, but in 1920s, there's a big depression. And then we have heard about the 2008 depression. And now, yes, uh, once again, we are going through some sort of a financial lack in society. And that brings about some sufferings into our lives. Sometimes the suffering comes because of moral degradation of the society, abuse of children, abuse of weaker section of society. Sometimes it is because of personal suffering, of broken relationships. And sometimes suffering comes into our life because of sicknesses, whether it could be uh, cancer, whether it could be uh, heart issues. And presently, the whole world is affected by this pandemic called the coronavirus. And in the midst of this particular season, as I was praying and asking the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to share to your church? And this particular passage that came to my mind, and I thought, yes, let us look into the word of God and see what the word of God says or speaks about suffering. So today's passage that is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 to 7, it deals with the subject of suffering. Well, if you look into verse number one itself of 1 Peter, uh, verse one, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So when we are going through sufferings in our lives, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, the first and foremost thing we have to understand as Peter speaks over here, saying that he, the apostle of Jesus Christ, he is addressing to the pilgrims that are dispersed, that have been scattered around the whole region of Asia Minor. So first thing which I would like to tell you and tell myself, which I tell our local church, that we as believers should understand that we are pilgrims on this earth. Another word which says uh, in the King James, it says about sojourners, that we are sojourning this particular earth, this particular season in our life. Our residency, permanent residency is not on this earth. In the book of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul reminds the church in Ephesus that our citizenship is in heaven. Our eyes, our minds should be fixed should be fixed heavenwards as we live on this earth. So this is the very first thing which I would just like to is an introduction to tell you as a church that we have to understand that we are pilgrims on this earth. In India, uh, there are different religions which you are aware and each religion, each particular thing, uh, group has got their own pilgrimage center. And when, we, when those people go for pilgrimage, they don't carry everything of their house, of their home on this journey. They will not say, let me carry my television set because I want to see my program, uh, my favorite program on that particular television set. They will not carry their favorite chair along with them saying that no, only on this chair I can sit and relax. They will not carry with them their bed or their mattress saying that without this, I will not get sleep. They know that they are on a pilgrimage. It's a temporary journey. And in this temporary journey in the pilgrimage, they may encounter some problems, some difficulties, but they know that this is going to be temporary for a short period. And in this particular pilgrimage journey, 
they don't carry everything what they what they want but they carry what is necessary so we as christians as born again believers in christ should understand that we are pilgrims on this earth our permanent residency is not on this earth but it is in heaven so as peter is explaining to and writing this letter to the christians to the believers that have been dispersed he is telling that you have to understand that we are pilgrims and as pilgrims we will face sufferings in this life and when we face suffering what are we going to consider as we look into the word of god so this morning even as we turn to verse number 3 of 1 peter chapter 1 verse number 3 if we have your screen uh the first point that could be displayed verse 3 it says anybody would like to read a verse 1 peter chapter 1 verse 3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ according to his great mercy he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. So this is what Peter is introducing he's saying blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to something. He has begotten us again to a living hope. the first point which i would like to drive to you this morning is that you and i have a living hope many people in this world put their hopes on 2020 i still remember the night after the night service on uh, basically the early morning 1st january 2020 people were talking about this new decade and what things they're going to accomplish and do whether it is in their career whether it is in their business whether it is in their social field whatever sometimes we put our hopes on to things and on to people but in all these things there are occasions our hopes will die sometimes our hopes can be vain you can pin your hope on someone who said he is going to help you he is going to do something into your life and that particular person gets transferred gets moved away or that particular person passes away what happens your hope is dead but what peter is telling here to the believers in christ that our hope is a living hope how can you say that your hope and my hope is a living hope it is based on the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead there is no one in this world who experienced death and came back to life on his own accord except jesus christ and that is what peter is saying here that my dear beloved my dear believers pilgrims on this earth that we should know that we have a living hope and this hope comes through the resurrection of jesus christ through the sacrificial death of jesus christ and his resurrection we experience salvation so what we can see is that our sufferings when we are going through seasons of sufferings our suffering should be faced against the backdrop of a living hope and that living hope is jesus christ the resurrection of jesus christ when jesus lived on this earth when jesus was on the cross in the garden of gethsemane and all that was happening from the garden of gethsemane till the cross of calvary bible says he went through sufferings if you have your bibles in hebrews chapter 2 verse number 18 hebrews chapter 2 verse number 18 because he himself suffered when he was tempted he is able to help those who are being tempted yeah so what we can see over here the writer of hebrews is saying that he also suffered when he was tempted he went through all the sufferings sometimes i come across people who say that you know pastor brother i'm going through so many sufferings in my life and i think god doesn't understand But the word of god is so very clear that he has gone through all those things he suffered all those things and he can understand us in the book of hebrews again chapter 4 verse 15 the bible says yes we have a high priest who can sympathize with us because he has gone through all those things that we are going through in our life in the book of hebrews chapter 5 verse number 8 the writer again says that though he was the son of god 
he learned obedience to the things he suffered in his life so when we are going through sufferings in our life when we are facing sufferings let us face it against the backdrop that you and i have a living hope that yes my savior himself went through all the sufferings and finally in hebrews chapter 12 on this particular point it says the writer says in uh, verse 2 hebrews 12 verse 2 it says looking unto jesus in verse 1 he speaks about running the race that is set before us how we are going to run this race we are going to run this race by looking unto jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him he endured the cross jesus saw the cross of calvary he knew very well that he had come on this earth to die on a cross but he endured that cross why because he could see the joy that was beyond the cross beyond the cross or salvation of mankind beyond the cross or mankind can again be reconciled to god the father and when he saw that he endured the cross he despised the shame and now he is seated at the right hand of the throne of god and then the bible says in hebrews chapter 12 verse 3 consider jesus consider him who endured all this hostility from sinners he went through all the sufferings he endured all this hostility from sinners against himself consider jesus when we look at jesus you know Uh, we preachers sometimes are very guilty uh, what we do is that we just tell the congregation you know jesus heals yes he heals jesus performs miracles yes he performs miracles but we forget to tell people that yes jesus also said that in this world you shall have tribulations and that's what happens when we preachers keep on preaching about healing miracle goodness blessings earthly blessings but we fail to prepare them that yes there are going to be sufferings also there are going to be tribulation there are going to be persecution there are going to be tough times then what happens a believer is in for a shock and that's what the book of hebrews writer of hebrews says here consider jesus what you got to consider what aspect of life of jesus we got to consider he says consider jesus and that part of his ministry or his life that he endured all this hostilities all the sufferings from the sinners against him this is when you consider that and you take that as an example you will not become weary you will not get discouraged in your souls so my dear friends the very first thing that i would like to share with you this morning from the book of peter 1 peter chapter 1 verse 3 it says that sufferings should be faced against the backdrop of a living hope my dear friends you may go through sufferings in this world everybody goes through it and sometimes we as believers think why should i go through it because i'm a child of god and my god is an eternal god my god is all, all almighty god all powerful god omnipotent but remember there are times god takes us through a season of sufferings when we we have to face them against the backdrop that you and i have a living hope sufferings will not last for a long period we have a living hope through the resurrection of jesus christ secondly in verse number Four. Can someone else uh, unmute your mic and read verse four or one Peter chapter one? To an in, to inherit to inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Yeah. So Peter continues that train of thought. He says, "God through Jesus Christ has begotten us again to a living hope. We all have a living hope. How?" through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and then he has begotten us to an inheritance i think so there is no one who is listening to me this morning there is no one who does not like receiving an inheritance we all love to receive an inheritance you don't have to work for it it comes to you because you belong to a certain family but there are times in life i have experienced and i have come across people there are times when earthly inheritance can be denied maybe the father will say i don't want to give this particular uh, property to my son to my daughter i would rather donate it to some charity to some organization it can be denied sometimes an inheritance can be taken from you you could be cheated 
people may defraud you. And I have known of certain uh, believers also who have been defrauded by their own siblings, you know. And then they say, why to fight a case? We lift it to God. Earthly inheritance can be taken away from you. Earthly inheritance can be denied. Well, in some cases, you may receive it and nobody can take it away from you. And you're quite smart and wise enough to handle it, uh, to be a good steward and use it wisely. Praise God for that. But still, earthly inheritance cannot be kept forever. When you leave this earth, when I leave this earth, I will leave that inheritance to someone else. Earthly inheritance can only be transferred to someone else. That means I am a steward for a period of time. It could be 10 years, 30 years, 50 years, or whatever. But I cannot keep it with me forever. I cannot take the piece of my property. I cannot take the bungalow, the villa, or whatever assets that I have. I cannot take it with me to heaven. So we can understand from all this that yes, earthly inheritance are good, praise God for it, and we can be a good stewards of it, but they cannot be for eternity. But when Peter speaks about here in verse number four, he says, God through Jesus Christ has begotten us to an inheritance which is incorruptible. That means it cannot be corrupted. Assets Blessings of the earth can become corrupted. But your inheritance in Christ can be corrupted. It is undefiled. And the wonderful thing says, does not fade away. Sometimes the shine, the luster of gold, silver, precious metals can fade away. But the godly inheritance which we receive through Jesus Christ, that does not fade away. And it is reserved in heaven for you. It's like I said, earthly inheritance can be taken away from you. Somebody can uh, cheat you. But what godly inheritance that God has kept through Jesus Christ for you, that has been reserved for you. I cannot go and fool God and tell to God, God, don't give that inheritance to Pastor Sam Kuti. Uh, it deserves to me. No, I, I have done much more than what he has done. I cannot fool God. I cannot turn the mind of God. What God is reserved for each and every individual, God knows exactly and it is meant for you. So, and that is what Peter is telling that, you know, that when you are going through a phase, a season of suffering, because when Peter is writing this particular epistle, the Christians, the believers in Christ were dispersed, were scattered all around Asia Minor. And they were going through a real hard times. Persecution by the Romans, persecution by the Jews. They were not sure about their future. Uh, they were scattered all over. They, they, they are not sure about their children's future. They don't know whether they're going to live another day or what's going to happen. So in the midst of all this, as they were going through suffering, Peter is reminding, yes, believers in Christ, you have a godly inheritance reserved for you in heaven. And that's all in John chapter 14. Verse 1 to 3, Jesus says, when he was speaking about that his imminent departure, physical departure from, uh, the, from the earth, and the disciples would miss him. They were very sad. They were troubled. In John chapter 14, verse 1, 2, and 3, Jesus says, let your hearts not be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. And then he goes on to say, in my father's house, there are many mansions. And I'm going to Go and prepare a place for you. And I will come back. See, the promise of Jesus is all. He's not just going and preparing a place and saying, okay, come on, now you find a place. And if you are quite smart enough to find a place, well, you can enjoy it. He says, I will come back to take you to the place where I belong. But that is the promise of Jesus Christ to a believer, to a disciple of Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, Verse 19 and 20. Basically, Luke chapter 10, from verse 1 onwards, uh, Jesus calls out the 70 uh, disciples. Then he sends them two by two. And he tells them to go to the countryside, go to the homes, uh, whichever homes accepts you. Uh, you meet there, pray for that family, and do the work of the Lord. And well, in verse number 17 onwards, uh, when they come back to Jesus, and they report to Jesus and saying that, 
yes master we have seen such great things such great miracles we have seen you no know, evil spirits being cast out we have seen healing all this while they have been seeing jesus performing miracles but now in this particular passage we find that the disciples were also used by god and the holy spirit to perform miracles so they were excited they came with good report not like a ten spies in numbers 14 but they came the good report with full of excitement saying that you know master this then that so many great things have happened in luke chapter 10 verse number 18 jesus says yes i saw satan fall like lightning and then verse number 19 he says i give you authority over all the works of over all the powers of the enemy and nothing by any means shall harm you so fantastic when you get this particular promise suppose you wake up in the morning Uh, and you remember the vision which god gave to you the previous night in a dream or whatever and it's like the voice of god speaking to you my son my daughter i am empowering you with a double portion of holy spirit from now on you're going to prophesy from now on wherever you lay your hands to who on whoever they shall be healed there shall be miracles being performed what will happen god forbid it not happen there in the church but in some cases Oh well, now I can tell the pastor. You can take retirement, and I will be the pastor. I will be the the prophet of uh, of this century or of this particular season because I am going to perform miracles. Or God is going to use me to perform miracles. So we are excited about all those things. But you know what does uh, Jesus say in verse number twenty of Luke chapter ten? Don't rejoice that spirits are subjected to you, but rather rejoice that your name has been written in heaven. Praise God for miracles when God uses you. Praise God for giftings which God gives you and you are used for the glory of God. But more than all of that, we have to rejoice in a godly inheritance. That yes, my name has been written in the book of life. Not because of me, not because of anything of my goodness, but it is by because of the grace of God. God has been merciful to me. so when we look at that you know what happens when we go through a particular suffering for a period we rejoice to it encourages because we have a godly inheritance that is incorruptible that is undefiled that does not fade away and that has been reserved for you in heaven by the lord almighty what is the use if i have been called to perform great miracles to perform great works but i find myself at the end that my name is not in a book of life my name is not there in heaven i have been just doing it for the sake of just my name and my fame it is just man's work so we have to understand as believers in christ that when we go through sufferings in our life face it against a backdrop that you and i have been called for a godly inheritance a bible scholar by name francis beard he says the godly inheritance is untouched by debt unstained by evil un, and unimpaired by time so that is the power of your godly inheritance so let not temporary sufferings take your focus away from the godly inheritance which god has promised you verse number 5 <clears throat> can someone else read verse 5 or uh, 1 peter chapter 1 who by god's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time yeah so thirdly what i would like to say is that suffering should be faced against the backdrop of divine protection as you and i we go through a season or a period of suffering of trials remember that you are kept you are divinely protected by the power of god many of the people one of their best psalm is psalm 91 here in goa even catholics will quote who are not born again but they too will quote psalm 91 but psalm 91 if you have your bibles i have not put it in slide but uh, if you have your bibles uh, psalm 91 was 9 onwards I'll just read uh, this passage is from the New Living Translation, but simplified. You know, Psalm ninety-one, verse nine onwards. The psalmist says, 
if you make the lord your refuge if you make the most high your shelter no evil will conquer you no plague will come near your home let me sort when god is your refuge we can sing that song god is my refuge and strength a very present help in time of trouble but when you really indeed make him as your refuge when you post god in your family what does that mean like when you host your pastor when you know that your pastor is coming to visit you but not in this coronavirus period but generally what do you do or oh, some guests are coming to visit you you are hosting them you prepare your home you clean your home you prepare keep everything in its place and if they are coming for uh, dinner or for lunch you prepare one of the best foods for them what about hosting god in your family hosting god in your house that yes god more than anybody else i need your presence so when he is your refuge when he becomes a shelter he says no evil will conquer you even it's covid 19 no evil will conquer no plague will come near your home verse 11 he will order his angels you don't have to order the angels god will order his angels to protect you wherever you go they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone that much how god will take care of you there might be difficulties there might be all the things coming but there is a divine protection you will trample upon lion and cobra you will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet the lord says i will rescue those who love me i will protect those who trust in my name the promise of god can you see this is not the psalm is saying but the psalm is writing what the lord is saying the lord says i will rescue those who love me don't just simply we quote the scripture and say wow do you really love him if you really love him you will follow him you will follow his commands i will rescue those who love me i will protect those who trust in my name when they call on me i will answer i will be with them in trouble i will rescue and honor them i will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation the greatest thing is salvation so we have to understand that when i am going through suffering as peter is writing to the christians uh, who are dispersed in the asia minor saying that you are going through suffering through difficulties but look and face the sufferings against a backdrop that you have divine protection you have been kept by the power of god and that is what we have to understand in the 21st century that our god has not changed our god has not become weak he is the same yesterday today and forever he is able to save you even today the fourth thing which i would like to share with you is found in verse number 6 sufferings should be faced against the backdrop that they are for a short period verse 6 guys would like to read it and this you were joyous though now for a little while if necessary you have been grieved by various trials yes so what the spirit telling here in this you greatly rejoice you know what do we rejoice yes we don't rejoice in suffering but james chapter 1 verse 2 james says my dear brethren count it pure joy when you fall into various trials i uh, frankly speaking we don't really count it joy but we say god when will this trial get over but what is james saying that we have to rejoice and the greek word for rejoice is leap for joy it's like you got your dream job the very first job and you got a dream job you will leap for joy and tell everybody in excitement you will post it on social media say i have got this job or something that you were dreaming of and you got it you will leap for joy and that is what peter says over here in this you greatly rejoice you not do we rejoice we rejoice that we have got a living hope we rejoice that we have got a uh, inheritance which is godly which is not defiled we rejoice that we have a divine protection and in this backdrop in this that you greatly rejoice though for now you for a little while if need be you are grieved with various trials that means for now for a period for a short time you may be going through trials what is god saying what is the word of god saying our response in this trial should be that we should rejoice remembering the promises of god in the book of second corinthians 
chapter 4 second corinthians chapter 4 verse 16 to 18 and once i told the church the congregation here in goa is that you know whenever we go through trials sufferings you know we don't like it and the natural reaction of a believer of anyone would be like we become very uh, sad we become very green and over a period of time when it uh, when it uh, elongates the period elongates what happens we become discouraged and then we get depressed and there are times when we start doubting god and we uh, get into unbelief i told the church let us remember these three verses which paul writes to the church in corinth second corinthians chapter 4 verse 16 to 18 can someone read it if you have got it so we do not lose heart Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this okay, life... We'll read first, uh, 16 itself first. So as we have read, as sister has read, you know, it says, do not lose heart. Even though outward man is perishing. When we are kids, we, uh, when we are young, we wait for our birthdays to celebrate. But yes, I'm nine years old, then the 10th birthday. Daddy, I want to celebrate my 10th birthday. You know? I want to celebrate my 18th one. I want to celebrate my 21st one. You know? But after a period of time, when you're 40, 50, then you don't really enjoy celebrating birthdays. Because saying, it's a reminder that I'm growing older. What is Paul saying here? Our outward man might be perishing. But for a believer in Christ, your inward man is being renewed day by day. When you spend time in the presence of God, in his word, when you spend time communicating with the Holy Spirit, who's your comforter, who's your guide, who's the one who strengthens you, you know what happens? Your inward man is being renewed day by day. And this is happening. Sister, carry on the next verse, 17. For this slight momentarily, momentary Affliction is preparing us for eternal way of glory beyond all comparison. Yeah, okay. verse number 17. So in New King James, Paul says, Our light affliction for our light affliction, which is for a moment. So, what is Paul describing the affliction as? Two things. One is it is light, second, it is for a moment momentary. So the affliction which is light and momentary is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So can you see the comparison? One is affliction and the other one is the glory of God. The affliction is working for us into the glory of God. What is affliction? It is light. It is for a moment. But what is the glory? It is exceeding and it is eternal. One word describes the quantity and the other word describes the duration. Affliction as far as quantity is concerned is light. Whereas glory that is concerned is exceeding. Duration of affliction is for a moment. But duration of glory of God is eternal. So what is Paul telling you over here to the believers, the church in Corinth, is that, you know, that when we are going through affliction, remember it, that this is a light affliction that we are going through. Remember it, that it is for a moment, for a short period, because all these things are working within us for an exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So my dear friends, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, I implore you that when you are going through suffering, the devil will put thoughts into your mind to uh, get discouraged, depressed, don't read the Bible, uh, don't really be involved in things of God. But you have to tell yourself, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul says that light afflictions is for a moment, but it is working for me, within me a far exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So I am going to go through this period of suffering because it's only for a short period. Romans chapter 8, verse 18, it says, Paul says to the church in Rome, I consider that the sufferings of this present time, the thing which I'm going through, the sufferings of this present time, are not worthy 
to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What suffering you are going through in this present time cannot be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. It is just like how you are comparing the currency of one particular third world country where the currency is so devalued and comparing the currency with a very powerful country whose economy is doing very well and is very strong. We can't be compared. In the same manner, Paul is saying that yes, the sufferings that you're going through in this present time cannot be compared to the glory which will be revealed in us. So my dear friends, the fourth thing which I would like to share with you is that when you go through sufferings, you should face it against the backdrop that they are for a short period only. And finally, basically in his book, Ron Davis, he's, uh, he has written a book called Gold in the Making. In that book, he says, when there is extreme pain, there has to be a significant time for healing. And we all know that when we go through a lot of pain, whether it's emotional, physical, longer period of time is required for healing. It is during these moments when we struggle with pain and suffering, we must not give up, but rather press on. So we have to keep pressing on in that particular period when healing is taking place because the greater the pain, greater the suffering, the greater time is required for healing. In that particular time, we should not give up. I want you to consider this poem called Don't Quit, which is there on your slide over there. And I think so you must be familiar with this particular poem, but just, uh, I just put it, I'll just read it for you. And this poet says over here, when things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging sinks all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, and you want to smile, but you have to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest you must, if you must, but don't you quit. Life is cured with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns. And many a fellow turns about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow, you may succeed with another blow. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup. And he learned too late when the night came down how close he was to the golden crown. Success is failure turned inside out the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And when you never can tell how close you are, it may be near when it seems afar. So stick to the fight when you are hardest hit. It's when things seem worst, you must not quit. It's a very, very familiar poem, Don't Quit. So what I would like to encourage you that when you're going through suffering, remember that this is only for a moment, for a short period. God is calling you and me to press on, remembering the promises what he has given for you, the promises of a godly inheritance, the promises of a living hope, a promise of divine protection. And finally, the fifth point, which I would like to share with you this morning is in verse number seven of 1 Peter chapter one. Can you read it, please? So that the tested genuous of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what Peter is telling here is that when you're going through suffering, face it against a backdrop that they are contributing towards shaping of a genuine faith. When you're going through difficult times, when you're going through trials, remember your faith is being tested and God is using those situations to shape within you a genuine faith. What God is more interested in, he's not interested in you having a new car or a new bungalow. Well, all that is good. But what is he interested really in is your character, is your faith. Is your life being conformed to the pattern of Jesus Christ, into the image of Jesus Christ. And when people look at your life, when people look at my life, can they see 
the glory of the risen Lord in my life. That is what God is looking from our lives. And he's using these things called suffering trials so that our life is shaped into the image of Jesus Christ. That we may have genuine faith. And that is what we have to understand. That you know, that our faith is being tested in the book of James chapter 1 verse 3. James says that through the testing, your faith is being renewed, being strengthened. Because it brings your faith stronger and stronger. It makes it stronger. William Barclay, one of the great Bible scholars who has written a great commentary of the whole New Testament, he says this way, the trials that come to men are tests of his faith. So when you are going through a trial, that means your faith is being tested. And he goes on to say, out of them, his faith can emerge stronger, clearer, and firmer than ever before. So when you are going through a suffering, when you are going through a trial, remember, as you endure it, your faith will emerge stronger, clearer, and firmer than before the suffering. And that is what we have to understand. As in Job chapter 23, Verse 10, Job declares, we know about Job, you know, we have heard a lot of preaching about Job and Job who uh, was so blessed and then all of a sudden over a period of one day, two days, you know, uh, he not only lost everything, but he lost his health also. But in Job 23, verse 10, Job declares and he says, when God has tested me, the second part of Job 23, verse 10, it says, when God, when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. When the testing of God over my life is completed, is over, and I will endure it, I will come forth as gold. You're being refined in pure gold. Another Bible scholar called M. Scott Peck, he says, courage is the capacity to go ahead in spite of fear or in spite of pain. When you do that, you will find that overcoming fear will not only make you stronger, but will be a big step towards maturity. And I understand in my life, and I've seen many people's life, and even in the word of God, that only through our brokenness, God can use us to bring wholeness to others in this broken world. When we go through brokenness, when we go through suffering, then only you and I can understand the suffering of others, and we'll be able to minister unto them with the power of God and the grace of God. And that is what we have to understand, my dear friends, that when we are going through sufferings, God is more interested in shaping our faith, that our faith becomes more genuine. And this is what I would like to encourage you, my dear church, my dear folks, uh, this morning, that when you are going through sufferings, don't give up. When you're going through sufferings, don't complain. It's easy to complain, it's easy to grumble, it's easy to get discouraged, and it's, uh, it's very easy to quit. It's like I had it enough, I cannot go in any more further. But when you're going through suffering, remember these five points. Yes, you can come with many more uh, study points, uh, not only from this particular epistle, but from various other portions. But this morning, I just want to dwell on this particular verses from verse 3 to verse 7. And where it says, suffering to be <laughs> against the backdrop of a living hope. Earthly hope can die. Earthly hope can be vain. You know, sometimes we have vain hopes. We trust in the wrong person. We believe in the wrong person. And it is useless. But we should know that as a believer, you have a living hope. That even when you're going through sufferings, I have a living hope because my Savior not only died, but he also resurrected. That's why I have a living hope. Suffering should be faced against the backdrop of a godly inheritance. You and I have a godly inheritance. Don't be like Esau, who for a bowl of stew exchanged his birthright. And later on he repented. He was crying, he was crying, but he didn't get it. You and I, as believers in Lord Jesus Christ, we have a godly inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, that will not fade away, and that is reserved for you. What is God? God has planned for you. It's for you. It is reserved for you in heaven. So when you are going through suffering, tell yourself, remind yourself that 
take your name and say that, yes, I have a godly inheritance and I will not give up. Suffering, that point, suffering should be faced against the backdrop of divine protection. Your God, my God, will never leave us nor forsake us. That is his promise. So when you say, God, you become my shelter, you become my refuge. Yes, God, I want to host you in my house, in my family, in my job, in my career, in all that I do. You know, God will take control of your life. He will protect you. There is divine protection. As we have seen in Job chapter 1, that there is divine protection of God over Job's life. And Satan also could not attack Job's life, Job's family, and Job's possession. Because God has protected it. So let us say, yes, God, I am going to uh, have divine protection over my life. Fourthly, suffering should be faced against the backdrop that they are for a short period. We try to, uh, we are very good in magnifying that short period using a magnifying glass and say, see my suffering, see my suffering so big. Nobody has gone through the suffering which I have gone through. But let us look into the scriptures which says that suffering, trials are for a short period. Afflictions are for, for a moment. And finally, suffering should be faced against a backdrop that they are contributing towards shaping of a genuine faith. God is interested in your faith and my faith. Finally, in the book of uh, Chronicles, God says, the word of God says that God is scanning the whole earth. He is looking at the whole earth. He is looking for a soul, for a person. Which person is he looking for? He is not looking for the richest man in this world. He is not looking for the most intelligent man in this world. But he is looking for a heart that is loyal to him, that is faithful to him. And in that particular person, he will show himself strong. So my dear friends, when you are going through suffering, remember God is shaping your faith. So it becomes a genuine faith. So with this, I would like to encourage you church members uh, in Sacramento. that Keep up the faith. Hold on to your faith and keep growing in faith in spite of the sufferings, in spite of difficult times because great is your reward in heaven. So may God bless you and I want to really thank Pastor Sam and for you and the church family for allowing me to speak into your lives from the word of God. And I really pray that you be a blessing into your life. In closing, I would just like to pray for you. Shall I do that? Sure, sure. Dear Father, we want to just thank and praise you for this uh, moment, for this day, for this opportunity that we have got to share the word of God. And I pray, Father, for each one of us, O oh Lord God, even as we have heard your word and we declare that your word, which is powerful, Lord, which is living, O oh Lord, which is active. Lord, I pray that your word will work into our spirits, into our soul. And Father, that we shall be blessed spiritually. And as we are blessed in our souls, Lord, we know, O oh God, that we will have good health and we will prosper in every good work. Father, I pray for uh, the church that Pastor Sam Kuti leads there in Sacramento. And we commit every church member, every church family into your mighty hands. And Father, even in this particular uh, time that uh, the whole world is going through, that USA is going through, oh God, I pray, Heavenly Father, that this church shall be a beacon of hope, shall be a lighthouse in that place. And Lord, that place shall be a uh, place where people will find refuge, Lord, where people experience the love of God. I especially pray for Pastor Sam Kuti and his family that you have taken them to this particular place to be a blessing to the kingdom of God. And so be it, O oh Lord God. We thank you once again for this friendship that we enjoy. May your name be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.